comes up. <laughs> I think what made Coach Parker so successful, in all honesty, it's a number of factors. One, I think he was probably way too smart to be a coach. I always said he would have been a great lawyer. He was a hard guy to argue with. And I think that made me a much better coach because I was, I was in here trying to really change the dynamics of a sport. So uh, I think, you know, hockey was coming out of the, you know, smoking cigarettes, beer drinking era and was trying to move into this sort of more scientific era where people are going to train in the off season. And one of the great things, what made coach Parker really good was his ability to adapt. I think people who probably knew the 1970, whatever, two or four national championship, Jack Parker would not have recognized him in a staff meeting or in a team meeting when we won the national championship in 2009. So he was able to win when you think he won in three decades, yeah. he won in the seventies, he won in the nineties, he won in the two thousands, he coached till he was 70. He is the single winningest coach, I believe in one sport at one school in the history of the NCAA. I think he won 790 some odd games, but what, again, what makes him so great? I remember people said, so I think it was 796. If, if I'm, I, I might be, a little bit off of my numbers. Right, because I think said, York and Mason are split between multiple schools, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. And somebody had said, you know, well, you're going to hang around and coach maybe just, a, you know, coach a few more games to get to 800. And he was literally like, who gives a shit? 795, 800, whatever. <laughs> you know, and other people would have been so caught up on, you know, getting the 800th win, doing all this stuff. He just didn't have that. He, he, didn't, he didn't have a big ego. It was all, he always talked about, it's not about me. He always used to talk about hockey. He said, hockey's not about the coaches, he said. And he would kind of dump on football and basketball. He's like, football and basketball, that's all about the coaches. He said, hockey's not about the coaches. Hockey's about the players. And wow. he was just brilliant. And he was the guy, I think the thing, and he, Coach Parker is an underappreciated guy. I think because he deliberately wanted to be an unappreciated guy, I think he intentionally, I always used to say to people, and this, I'll try to not swear too much in this podcast, but that's all right. I think- some people, Coach Parker would like some people to think he's an asshole because that would mean those people were going to leave him alone and he wouldn't have to worry about him. And, and I think that was a big part of his MO because the one thing that made Jack Parker unique in my experience was that he was the greatest crisis manager I've ever been around because he was there. You know, when I, we had three real crises during the time that I was there in terms of Travis Roy broke his neck, which was the worst one of the worst days of my life in all honesty of going through that process and realizing that, okay, one of our players was paralyzed. That's thank God that it, it's only happened in 40 years. I've only known two players that it's happened to. And when Dana Lang got hurt, it was the same thing, even though it wasn't really kind of on my watch, I guess at that point in time, but, but it's, it's goalie, on your hat. Yeah. Oh yeah. Terrible. I mean, our goalie JP McGursey actually got, got hit by a car a couple of years later and had a really traumatic brain injury and we had difficulty regaining his ability to talk and walk and all that stuff. And then we lost Mark Davis on nine 11. And in every one of those crisis situations, coach Parker kind of showed his true colors. He was the guy who really pulled everything together. And I think that was the stuff that I appreciated most about him that the people who don't know him probably have no understanding of it. I think he went out to eat with Travis once a week for, uh, uh, well, let's say it was 1996. So for, you know, Travis passed last year. So it was, a, it was over a 20 year period that he probably went to dinner once a week with Travis. And the difference with him, he didn't care if one person knew that. And he probably didn't want one person to know it, to be perfectly right. honest. He was better. So I just, I guess what made him, an amazing coach was that underneath the exterior that he wanted to present to everybody, the, the guy with the glasses falling off his head, screaming at the referee yeah. was this incredibly intelligent, incredibly caring guy who everybody. And I will tell you this. I don't know one person who calls him Jack. Who's been at BU during that. I've never referred to him as Jack in my life. I've never looked him in the eye and said, Hey Jack, what about this coach? Park. Everybody coach, everybody calls him coach. And pretty much, except for his true peers, his friends that are his age. Yeah. And these are guys who've gotten their own coaching jobs, guys that are coaching in the NHL. If you saw Mike Sullivan right now and he saw Coach yeah. Parker, he'd say, hi, Coach, how you doing? 
and Sully's 50 something years old and you know he's yeah. won a couple Stanley Cups himself and he probably couldn't spit the word jack out in front of coach try. Parker if he wanted to you know yeah. and wouldn't try he wouldn't even try that's no. the difference none of those guys would you know John Hines who's coaching none of these guys would would even think about it if they refer to it's coach or coach Parker and I think when you garner that level of respect that tells you and tells everybody else how you've treated everybody that you've come in contact with. Right. And it seems like when you get that level of respect, it's not only the breadth of your contacts or the breadth of your experience, it's the depth you have with all those individuals too. Oh, unquestionably. Yes. I mean, everybody, I think everybody, I always tell him, and I've told coach Parker this myself, so I'm not afraid to say it on the podcast. He's the most influential person in my life beyond my own parents. I think I've wow. learned more from being around him than anybody else that I had contact with. He's the reason I, I mean, I stayed at BU way longer than I should have. And I turned down a whole bunch of professional opportunities that probably would have made me significantly more money than I would have made at BU. But being able to be part of that relationship was an amazing thing. One, the guys, you know, we recruited unbelievable kids. Yeah. And we, I worked in an amazing environment where my work was appreciated. And I think these are all the things that people don't understand about jobs, but what makes a job great is working in an environment where people appreciate you and let you do your job. I mean, we were able to revolutionize how people train for hockey because coach Parker let me do it. I mean, he let me do things that I don't think at other schools, people would have let it happen. I think people would have stopped me at certain times and said, no, you can't do that. And his, we had one conversation all the time. Mike, will this help us win more games? And I'd be like, yep, I firmly believe this will help us win more games. And he was like, okay, question answered. Well, let's, yeah. let's do, you know, whatever it was, you know, lifting, running, buying equipment, you know, we were, we were at the forefront, particularly during the nineties. And I think I'm trying to remember. Yeah. During the nineties from like 90 to 2000, I think we went to the final four, nine times in the 10 year period. If I was to go back and look it up, I'm pretty sure. And I think we played in three final games and won one championship during that time. So we really were the dominant program of that decade. As much as uh, it pains me as a BC grad to admit that that's a hundred percent true. <laughs> yeah. I think, honestly. And that's what truly it made BC better when coach York got there. Yeah. That was one of the things. And they were the dominant team of the two thousands. Yeah. And probably had a very, very similar run. I think they actually won three championships during that time. But it, and I, I firmly believe that so much of that was rooted in that rivalry and the fact that, okay, you know, we're not going to be, we're not going to spend 20 years being second to BU.